Okay, we're recording now. Thank you. So it is uh, February 24th and uh, it is 6 p.m. My name is Mayor Julia Johnson and I am calling to order uh, the Siege of Willie City Council. If you will stand with me to say the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'd like to welcome Commissioner Janicki. I see she is um, visiting tonight, watching our council meeting. So welcome, Commissioner Janicki. Uh, let's move into roll call. I will begin with Glenn Allen. I see you. I didn't hear you. Present, present. <laughs> okay. The only reason I ask is so that we have it for the recording. That's all. Thank you. Um, Councilman McGoffin. Present. Thank you. Councilman DeYoung. Present. Thank you. Councilman Owen. Present. Councilwoman um, Kesty. Present. Councilwoman Kinzer. Present. And Councilman Loy. Here. Thank you. Okay. Looking for approval of the agenda. Do I have a motion? Madam Mayor, uh, Councilman McGoffin, I make a motion to approve the agenda. Thank you. Is there a Council second? Madam second. Mayor, Councilman Allen, I'll second. All right, thank you. So I have a motion by Councilman McGoffin, seconded by Councilman Allen. Any discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Okay, motion carries, thank you. Um, now moving into the consent agenda, do I have a motion? It's items one through five. Madam Mayor, I make a motion to approve the consent agenda, items one through five. Thank you. Councilman Owen, second. Thank you. So I have a motion by Councilwoman Kinzer, seconded by Councilman Owen to approve council agen consent agenda items one through five. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Okay, motion carries. Moving on to staff reports and I will start with um, um, Fire Chief Klinger. Good evening, uh, Mayor, Council, Commissioner Janicki. How are you? Um, just want to give a quick update. Uh, we were finally able to close out our uh, 2018 FEMA grant. Uh, we finally got all the items in, and we uh, were able to put in for payment on Monday. Uh, we requested payment, and we were notified on Tuesday that uh, uh, they had received our request and approved it and said uh, checks in the mail. So I don't know how well that we could be received from the federal government, but they, they said checks in the mail. Uh, still no update on phase three. I've been trying to track that and follow it. Um, nothing is coming out yet. Um, as I uh, shared with you, Mayor, I think that we're gonna see that phase three is gonna be tied to vaccines, um, but I'm, I'm just thinking that it will there, but I haven't heard anything for sure. Uh, the last we knew uh, earlier today, we were about uh, 100 um, of the 100,000 as far as where we're at. Uh, and I was looking back through some of our old memos um, just a few months ago when we were at uh, 24.8 and we were hoping to get to the 25. Um, and it was, it was kind of funny how things have changed in the six months. I mean, I'm happy that we're only at 100 of 100,000. Um, 
about 25,000 uh, vaccines have been brought in Skagit County. I'm not uh, sure if that, and maybe Commissioner Janicki can answer that, uh, if, if we've been, uh, if that's counting what's going on as far as th through the tribes also. I know DeWallace has been giving out quite a few vaccines, but I don't know if they're in that, that number of that 20, you know, of all Skagit County. Um, but other than that, uh, and then the new FEMA grant uh, that we put in for it, it's, it's now on its way, it's been sent off. So uh, Frank and uh, Chief Carpenter are just waiting to hear, uh, hopefully we'll, they'll get some news uh, uh, before 2021 or ends. <laughs> but the way these FEMA grants, I told them, don't be surprised if it's into 2022 when you hear it. So that's all I have, unless anybody has any questions. Are there any questions for the chief? Um, if not, uh, uh, I would comment. May I comment? Absolutely, go ahead. Um, yeah, D. Twally continues to give um, vaccines on the average of probably 75 a week right now between first and second vaccine. So we've probably given a total of, oh gosh, I can't even imagine, but probably 400 um, at least first vaccine at this point. Wow. Yeah, and I'm, wow. those are where I'm not sure if those are actually counted in Skagit County Health Department counts or not. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure curious. either, um, Chief. I don't know. I'm not sure. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to give Commissioner Janicki an opportunity to answer if she would so choose. I, I don't know the answer to that. I was just gonna say Mayor Johnson and I were in the same briefing this morning and didn't think to um, actually ask that particular question though. Um, my guess is no, that the tribal allocations since they come straight from the feds are not included in the count because Jennifer also distinguished that the allocations to certain pharmacies are, are not in the count that come straight from the um, fed, feds and don't go through uh, Department of Health allocations. So my guess is no, but We'll confirm that. All right. Thank you, Commissioner Janicki. Okay, and moving uh, no, on. Uh, Mayor, if I Go ahead, uh, Councilwoman Kinzer. Yes. Um, we are not only giving the vaccines to tribal members, but also to employees and their spouses and um, immediate family members. So it is reaching out to a far, far wide range of community members. Well, that's great that they're offering that. Thank you for letting us know. Thank you. Okay. If there are no other questions, I'm gonna move on to uh, Police Chief uh, Lynn Tucker. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor, thank you. Um, I guess uh, keeping in the COVID vein, um, we got the last of our folks uh, vaccine vaccinated um, yesterday, I do believe. Um, about half of our department was down with just for about a day uh, after the vaccine with uh, kind of that cruddy illness that people have been experiencing with it, but everybody's bounced back. I got a little bit of it when I got my second vaccine and ibuprofen knocked mine back. So um, we're back or we're kind of wrapping all that up and happy to get through that. Um, on our personnel side, we've got... Um, uh, Officer McGahays finishing training uh, next week. So we're gonna turn him loose on the population of Cedar Woolley in one week. Um, I think his training officer is ready to kick him out of the car and he's ready to jump out of the car. So um, they're ready to roll. And then about a week and a half after that, we should have two and possibly three more of our newest officers. They all got out of the academy about the same time. Uh, one of them, Kira, was a little delayed. She got pretty sick on both COVID vaccines, so had some sick time off. So she was a little bit behind Harry. They should have been finishing up together. So that's going to put four new patrol officers on the street um, by the 16th or 17th of March. And on the 17th of March, we should be getting um, Brady out of the uh, academy. He should be graduating from the academy. They've had such a mess of trying to keep them folks in the academy that it's it's hard to keep up with him. He should have been out of the academy tomorrow, but he's not out until March 17th. Um, then we've got Max is still in training. He's still got a couple more months. 
And we've got a new hire that we've offered a job to, Seth Bass. He's got an academy date, I believe, uh, April. Uh, it's like the first week of April. Uh, Dan's got that. So we got him already scheduled. And we're looking at the one more person that we need to hire to replace our two losses uh, at the end of last year. Um, and one of the people that we're looking at already has the police academy under her belt. And I do believe it's a female officer um, from Bothell. Uh, I just got the briefest rundown when I was passing my lieutenant today. So we'll get a little bit more information on that when it firms up and we see what the background looks like. Um, and with all that good news, we've got Officer Cates is heading for his military deployment. So there's a little bit of bad news. We're losing one officer for a year. Uh, so he's taken off for that. And the last thing I've got is um, if you take a look at our uh, social media, um, there's a preview. I think this Friday we're going to have the full video of the eight or 10 of us from the police department, the fire department, and District 8 fire department doing the polar plunge in a wonderfully whatever the opposite of heated pool was up at fire station two, um, you know, the, if we'd thrown ice in it, I do believe it would have warmed it up a little bit, but uh, there's just a little preview of me doing a beautiful swan dive into that water and uh, coming up spluttering. Fortunately, I couldn't say anything because my mouth was full of water and I was frozen, but good time was had by all of us. We really appreciate the fire department putting that together for us. And with that, that's all I have. All right, thank you. We will be swearing in three more officers, I believe, just a month from tonight, will we not? Yeah, I do believe so. Good news. All right, thank you, Chief. Any questions for the Chief? All right, hearing none, we'll move on to Director of Building, John Coleman. Good evening, Mayor, City Council. Um, so give a update on what the Planning Commission was, uh, worked on. They had a meeting last week and had uh, and reviewed the electronic reader boards in the central business district. I think they made really good progress and we're hoping to have something for them to review, some actual code that they uh, can, can look at. They've given us good ideas, good direction. And we talked about locations. Uh, so that's going along nicely, probably still a few months before it comes to council though. The Planning Commission also held a public, first of two public hearings for some periodic updates to the Shoreline Master Program. Uh, we adopted the Shoreline Master Program in 2016, a major revision. So we don't really have a whole lot of major updates to it this year, just some things that ecology is requiring to be updated to meet current regulations. And uh, so that's going along swimmingly. And then I've got two items on tonight's council agenda. So you'll be hearing plenty from me tonight. So uh, I'll leave it at that unless anybody has any specific questions for me now. Are there any questions for Mr. Coleman? Okay, I do not see any. And I believe that next Wednesday we have a joint um, training session or planning session, do we not? Planning commission and the council will be coming together. Yes, so next Wednesday at the work session will be a joint city council planning commission work session. It's a, we do these twice a year. It's a good opportunity for the planning commission to get some face time with the city council. And of course, we'll go over some business too. We'll be talking about the 2021 comprehensive plan update cycle. So if there's any, uh, you know, what, one of the things I'll be asking the city council about is if there's anything specific in the comprehensive plan, any of the elements there that uh, <clears throat> you felt needed uh, to be reviewed. And this will be an opportunity to look at it. Again, that uh, the comprehensive plan the, was also in 2016, we did a major revision and we were required to do another major revision in 2025. And we'll be gearing up to do that uh, probably not until 2022 or 2023 through uh, the county and uh, Skagit Council of Governments will be uh, doing a regional 
view of our growth projections and see uh, and coordinate all of the city urban growth areas, uh, expansions or changes as necessary at that time. So this year on, the, on our 2021 comprehensive plan update cycle, there's not a lot to review. And I'll give you more information about that on Wednesday night, but uh, just to put the, put the feelers out there, if there's anything that the city council is wanting to see with, uh, done with the comp plan, we'll be talking about that at the, the work session next week. And so you can think ahead. All right. Thank you, John. Uh, Director of Public Works, Mike Freiberger. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, Council, Commissioner Janicki. Um, just a few things to update you on. Our uh, American Disabilities Act transition plan uh, is getting close to a final draft. I should have that on Friday. Uh, we'll have that to you for a first read on April the 14th after we get through the rest of our process. And, uh, hopefully for final adoption on the 28th. It is due by the end of April, uh, at least uh, to have it uh, in place uh, according to federal rules. Um, our uh, SR20, SR9 Township project uh, design is moving ahead. I also should see that on Friday and then 90% uh, plans. Uh, we have uh, secured the temporary construction easements from the ARCO station owner. Uh, so we're ready to go with certification of of that project and should be able to seek obligations of the federal funds in the next uh, two to three weeks uh, and have that in place. We have found out, however, I, I'm in the process of still confirming, but it looks like the signal poles themselves are four to six months out, which means we'll probably go ahead and bid the project, award it, uh, and then suspend it uh, so that the contractor can submit on the materials for that uh, and the construction itself isn't likely to take place until uh, the summer of 2022. Uh, David is also working on the design work for our TIB funded Wicker Road Overlay Project. Uh, we're doing uh, some ADA ramp upgrades in association with that at the intersection of Township and State Street, uh, long needed there by the, uh, the large housing complex. And beyond that, uh, our wastewater treatment plan electrical improvements project, the contractor is planning to mobilize on March the 8th and begin that work. It's about uh, a 45 day contract to complete that. And uh, we'll be glad to get that one underway and get it completed uh, in uh, June. BNSF, uh, the undercrossing, uh, we have not received their contract as yet. We've got all the details pretty well worked out with them. It's just a matter of their uh, legal department getting us the document to sign. So I'm hoping you will see that uh, by the uh, uh, first or second meeting in March uh, for your approval. The NSF is uh, moving ahead on their end with the final design. I understand they've ordered the piles as well, kind of at their own risk, but uh, at the end of the day, that, sh that should happen uh, in sequence. And they are uh, scheduling to have the work finished uh, for that initial phase of that project by April, I mean, excuse me, by June 30th, uh, which is our uh, date that we have to spend the state funds that we have allocated for the project. Uh, finally, just for any of you who are uh, curious about it, uh, Eastern Avenue uh, over in front of the, uh, the uh, Pioneer Market, uh, we do plan to overlay that project as a part of our street work this this summer. Uh, Nathan is setting up for that. We'll be doing some ADA ramp upgrades in association with that. And if you've been by the new library, Doug will be talking about that. It's getting pretty close. Uh, our crew is this week is removing the rest of the old BNSF track song in there. When we get that done, we're going to grade it out, put some topsoil on it and seed it. And hopefully by uh, early mid spring, that'll be green. So uh, that should be a nice addition to the to the uh, ambiance of the library. And Mayor, that's all I have. All right. Thank you, Mark. I, Are there my I other thing. Uh, one, Mayor, other... I... <laughs> one, one moment, one moment, um, Councilwoman. Yes. Sir. Go ahead, Mark. I apologize. Uh, I, I meant to mention uh, we were asked to look at putting a, uh, a E, uh, LED uh, flashing uh, stop sign pair at the Jameson and uh, 
township intersection, and we've looked into that, and uh, that's quite affordable, and it looks like a good addition there. Uh, Nathan, when we went out and looked at it today, told me he was there when there was a, a, a driver that drove through that intersection, so he's a very aware of the issues that are happening with speeding and that kind of stuff there. So we are moving ahead with that. Just wanted to let you know that. I'm sorry for not thinking it was there. No, thank you. Go ahead, Councilwoman Kinzer. Yes, my questions are um, to Mark. Mark, what are your estimations on when the library will actually be able to open to the public with all the COVID restrictions? I'm going to defer to uh, Doug on that. He's keeping better track of those things. Okay, okay. Thank you. Actually, actually, I could answer that. We haven't determined when we're going to open, when the city hall is going to open. Is that what you're asking? I have been well, in touch with other mayors. We want to be in step together when we do that. And I've also been in touch with Jean Williams at the library um, because we also want to be in step when we move forward with opening up. Is okay, there a Madam, will it be, um, will a library open in conjunction to when city hall opens then? So I'm um, so I am just keeping uh, Jean informed of what we're doing, and that will be her determination. She does have there's a checklist of things that she will have to complete before she can open up. So um, I certainly don't want to put any pressure on her to uh, force her to open up before she's supposed to. But I can tell you, she is very excited about having the public come in and see the building. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. I'm, I'm sure it is. And it's yeah. exciting and I understand we, if we really don't know, if we really right. don't have any answers yet. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, any other questions? Okay, we will move on to uh, Director of IT, Bill Chambers. So um, we're uh, continuing outfitting of the public safety vehicles with uh, technology um, we're working with uh, staff on the cemetery management software, RFP, and uh, reviewing estimates for phase 2.1 of the council chamber's AV upgrade. Working with uh, Sergeant Blunt on uh, the CGIS security audit, which we do about, I believe it's every three years, and it's pretty intensive, so that'll probably take a week or two. Um, the new uh, leased multifunction copiers from RICO are scheduled to arrive on Tuesday of next week. So we'll get those set up um, for uh, the users that are connected to those. And uh, workstation upgrades um, continuing on our replacement schedule. And that's it. Okay, thank you. Are there any questions for Mr. Chambers? Okay, hearing then we'll move on to financial manager. Jill Scott. Um, Jill, uh, you're, I think you're still on mute. Sorry about that. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, I don't have much to report tonight. We're just continuing to work on 2020 wrap up, and Doug will be Doug will likely be working with Mark on presenting that sometime in the future. There's always a lot to do at the end of a year and the beginning of a year, so we're very busy doing that and supporting the various departments. And of course, the big news is um, Mark Roberts, the new finance director, is set to arrive soon. So um, we've been working with IT and our different accounts just to make sure that he is set up to have everything that he needs um, to hit the floor running. And that's all I have for tonight. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Monday, as and I, I do believe he begins on Monday. But I know that uh, Deb will give us more information on that, so I'm not going to steal his thunder. I'm going to move on to City Attorney Nikki Thompson. Good morning or good afternoon, Mayor and Council. I don't have a whole lot to add. Um, we are working on some bigger ordinances that you will see in the very near future, including a rewrite of Title VI, which is the Animal Code. And then also, um, we've got a, a big franchise coming your way soon with the PSC renewal. So. Um, a lot of things going on in the background, but probably nothing of interest to the group this evening. But we'll be in the future. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, city Supervisor Doug Merriman. All right. Thank you, Mayor and City Council. Good evening. 
I've got uh, several things actually, just to give you quick updates on. Uh, when I look at the people, land, and money categories, I'll start off with people. Uh, we have a couple different things we're doing as staff at the city. I'm working on right now is public records training. We've all, council included, the mayor, have been through our public records training, but uh, in working with Nikki, we're seeing that we need some additional in-depth training for staff. And this is in areas on how, from the date a request comes in all the way until we close that request. So things like what information can we redact or leave in? Uh, there's just a lot of different things that we need to update on our policies and get that solidified up. So we're arranging some training and putting together the list of participants. We start working on that today and we'll be moving that along. Uh, that's a risk area we want, want to make sure we're on top of and that we're doing everything the way we should be. Uh, along with that, I have talked to the mayor some about leadership training for our managerial staff. It's been quite some time since that's been done. So um, I've reached out to a couple of training areas to look at uh, what they can do. And it's um, one of those things for department heads, even those of us that have been around a long time, that area in leadership changes all the time. You get different generations of staff coming through and we all need to be aware we can always stand for a good brush up on our training. So we'll be doing that as well. Uh, hand in hand with that, uh, we're going to be doing uh, performance evaluations. This is something the city hasn't done too much in the past. So uh, actually uh, the mayor and I were going over a draft of some things today as far as how we would approach those and get input from staff. Uh, one of the things I've seen over my career is performance evaluations. A lot of times your boss comes in and gives you the report card and says, thank you very much, see you next year. Uh, I do things a little bit differently. Uh, it should be a little bit more interactive where uh, staff actually gets a chance to self-rate and I even get in there and say, what can I do to help you? And it's more of an interactive process where we look at things on what we're gonna accomplish and take a more of an approach that way than the report card approach. Um, and then the last part on that is a personal policy manual. Uh, Nikki, our city attorney has a draft she's put together and we're starting to work through that. Our current manual was written in 1990 and uh, some things have changed since that time. So we're gonna be looking at making those changes to our manual and working with staff to getting those things updated. A uh, couple of people things, uh, kind of on a sad note or melancholy note, uh, Tony Niskanen, our building inspector has given notice. He's gonna be leaving the city. Uh, Tony's been with us quite a while and he's been the face of the city out there with contractors and that. Um, so, Someday I'll unlock his office and let him out, but I think we're going to try to hang on to him as long as we can. And he's uh, offered to kind of help us out and make that a smooth transition. So we'll be working on that. Uh, one kind of note of kudos to give, and that is Mark Freiberger, our public works director. Uh, Mark is uh, the, the guy who's always in the numbers and working the projects and everything. Um, He's also been our face a little bit this last couple of weeks. Uh, we've been working with our legislative representatives. Uh, the mayor has set up those meetings and that. And uh, in a way, Mark has been our Vanna White. He's, it's his face on the screen talking about the projects and explaining those. And he's done a great job of that. Uh, he has a day job as well. So he's been doing a lot of those things uh, and putting an extra time in that. I just wanted to thank Mark for that. He did a great job at representing the city on that. Who else do I have on here? Uh, Mark uh, Roberts is our new finance director. Uh, he's coming up from National City, California. I think literally at this moment, he's probably driving this way. Uh, they've been working on getting a place to live, um, at least a rental for now. And uh, his start date is March 1st. That may be a plus or minus in there, just depending on when he can get settled in. But believe me, we're looking forward uh, to having him on board. And uh, as Jill said, we have a list of things ready and waiting for him. So it'll be exciting to get him on here and exciting to bring him uh, to city council and you guys can get to know him as well. Um, the library project, if I go to land, um, the library, I actually signed off on the substantial completion documents that was on the 17th of February. 
uh, that's a big step for us. That's when the contractor starts turning over the building to us. Uh, we have our final punch list items. We're just steadily working those down. They're mainly in the area of electrical. Uh, we have a couple of countertops to finish up. So we're getting down to those final things. You know, they say sometimes the last 5% takes 90% of the time, you know, and it, um, it kind of looks that way. But I think with the substantial completion signed off and we get our punch list signed off, the construction component of the, the library will be essentially done. So uh, we're actually getting to that point and starting to work with Gene now on uh, the moving process. Uh, we have a couple different buildings involved besides the new library. So it'll take a little bit of time yet. Uh, we don't have an actual date as the mayor mentioned that we're gonna be open but uh, it's getting close. Everybody's getting pretty excited about it. And then finally on the money side, um, Jill mentioned it's year end. So we do have a lot of reports, uh, USDA reports, grant reports, all kinds of things. We're crunching and getting those out. There's a lot of deadlines on those. Jill's been doing a great job at keeping that moving. Uh, we did uh, some work this week on our recycle program and solid waste. Uh, Council member Loy actually called in and asked some good questions about recycle. So uh, I'm actually going through the solid waste fund with Leo's help and we're splitting it out into pieces. So what's our regular garbage pickup and what does that cost? And is that paying for itself? Uh, and we're splitting out recycle as well. And just showing so we can look at these different functions and make sure our pricing is right and uh, we kind of know what we're looking at. I know we've had conversations about recycle as a council lately. And uh, so we think this will be good support information for some of those conversations we need to have. So I'm hoping to get that wrapped up here in the next couple of days. And I think for now, that's all I got for tonight. Thank you. All right, thank you. So moving on to council reports, I'll begin with Councilman Loy. I don't really have much to say, Mayor. All right, thank you. Councilman Allen. Yes, Mayor Julia. Okay, I, I, I'm just gonna be a grumpy old fart again. <laughs> yeah. uh, is there really, and this is gonna go to Mark, is there really a problem at Township and Jameson or is it one or two people's problem and do we have to reinvent the wheel? Uh, you know, uh, Chief Tucker has put that car down with the speed, you know, tell you, tells you the speed and stuff. Uh, what can we do? We can't regulate intelligence of drivers. And I don't see it as, I've driven down that and it's not that busy of a road. Okay, I'm off. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we're seeing about 4,000 vehicles a day on Jameson from our counts. Uh, so it's actually fairly busy. Um, and, I, you know, it's anecdotal uh, to be sure, Council Member Allen, but uh, Nathan has, has observed a recent accident and I've heard of others. And certainly when this first came to us uh, from uh, Council Member DeYoung, uh, one of the neighbors uh, in his ward had noted that they observed uh, close calls and actual accidents there. So the cost of what we're planning to do is pretty minor. Uh, and if it raises the awareness of, of the drivers a little bit, saves one accident, certainly is well worthwhile, pretty low cost thing. So I, I think it makes sense to move ahead uh, with this particular one. So um, we do, do we do it on Bennett and Sterling and, Jennings and every other street there? No, but I do think that if there are um, higher volume arterial streets, uh, this is a good thing for us to see how it works, if it improves things at all. Uh, and it would be easy to deploy some of those other ones uh, in our normal process of updating stop signs. They're relatively inexpensive. And, and uh, that's, that's why I'm, I'm certainly uh, good with going ahead with it. Thank you. Anything else, Councilman Allen, or is that is that your? Did you just no have a more, question? 
more mayor. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Um, Councilman McGoffin. Hi, thank you, Mayor. Uh, I have no report tonight. Okay, thank you. Councilman DeYoung. Good evening. Uh, yes, we've had uh, a little bit of wind blowing and we've seen some uh, tree activity uh, happening in the neighborhood to help uh, folks uh, mitigate property damage. And uh, so that's that's going on in the neighborhood. And uh, I am pleased to hear about uh, um, the improvement to the stop sign on Jameson and Township. Thank you, Mark, for looking into that and looking at the engineering component of the three E's to help uh, with traffic, which is engineering, education, and enforcement. So thanks a bunch for that. Personal note, I uh, might be typing a little slower uh, uh, for a little bit or getting to that mute button a little uh, slower. I had uh, bilateral hand surgery today um, and uh, am recovering. So please uh, uh, patience and I uh, indulge your compassion on me getting to a mute button. Thank you. Yeah. Gosh, Carl, did not know that. I wish you um, a, an expedient recovery, a complete and expedient recovery. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, moving on to Councilman Owen. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I, I don't have anything tonight. All right, thank you. Councilwoman Kesty. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, tonight we had a utilities meeting with Mark Freiberger. Uh, the committee discussed multifamily sewer general facilities charges um, that Mark will be bringing uh, to the council for full or full council. And if Mark wants to add to any of that, I'll let him. Otherwise, that's all that I have. All right. Thank you. Mr. Freiberger. Yes. Thank you, Mayor. Just to add to that a little bit, uh, the discussion was not uh, anything uh, relating to what council uh, chose not to act on last time, which was to leave the calculation of general facilities charges for sewer on multifamily unchanged. That's not altered by what the discussion was tonight. What we did discuss was the timing of collection of the fees. And uh, we talked about that in the in light of uh, the fact that uh, uh, the current methodology of collecting them at issuance of building permit does place a fairly large burden on the uh, developers cash flow wise. Uh, we're looking at possibly uh, using uh, developer agreements, which are permitted under state law, uh, to look at the timing of those things. Uh, it has no effect on the revenue stream of the city to speak of. Uh, fully, uh, our, our financial plan would still be fully uh, satisfied by the payment of the full impact fees. Uh, it would just change the timing somewhat. Any uh, implementation of that would come to council for your re full review. Uh, in the form of approval of a developer agreements when they come up. And so that was the main part of that discussion. Thank you, Chairman. All right, thank you. Uh, and uh, Councilwoman Kinzer. Hi, good evening. Um, my greatest concern will um, happen down the road here in the meeting, but I would also like to share with the council uh, email I received from a constituent um, and noticed that email did not go out council wide. So I'm gonna read it to you anonymously. And I advise this constituent that it would probably be in their best interest to bring it to the council in a public comment and involve any people in the neighborhood who also have the same concerns to bring it to the council. So I'm gonna read this anonymously and hope you all take it into consideration. So here we go. Um, my wife and I recently bought a house near the corner of Rita and West Talcott. Since moving to Sid Woolley last August, we have noticed that many drivers use the neighborhood streets of West Nelson and Rita as a thoroughway from Highway 9 to State Street and vice versa. For residents of these neighborhoods, that makes sense but too often many drivers speed down these residential streets to beat the traffic along the major arterials. My wife and I have noticed this because we have an 18 month old son that we take out regularly in the neighborhood 
and walk along West Nelson and Rita Street. My concern, and why I'm writing you, is that the neighborhood streets are often populated with kids, as they should be, including my own, from high school kids with, on skateboards to younger kids riding their bikes or playing with balls and walking along the road. Last summer slash fall, my wife and I witnessed several close calls as drivers sped through the neighborhoods at greater than 30 miles per hour and kids almost got hit due to a ball bouncing in the road or while trying to ride their bikes. I see this issue only getting worse as more people, quote, find these through streets to get off the major roads, Highway 9 and State Street, and speed through to beat traffic. I see it getting worse as more families have also moved into the neighborhoods around these streets, whether it be the recently completed Habitat for Humanity houses, the apartments along Rita, or the apartments set to be built just west of Rita Street. More kids will continue to play in and along the roads of this neighborhood. I would appreciate a response with, with regard to possibility putting in speed bumps along West Nelson and Rita Street. This would not only discourage cars from cutting through the neighborhood streets, but also keeps kids slash pedestrians safe as it forces cars to lower the speeds on roads that are not supposed to be the main arterials in Sigaroli. Thank you for your time in reading this and blah, blah. Okay, we'll skip the rest of that, but um, I have encouraged this resident to bring this to council on an their own as public comment. You now, also encourage any residents in that area to include their comments because I had a good friend living right on the corner of Rita Street and West Nelson, spent a lot of time there visiting, and I have seen this traffic problem on my own personally. And I think it is definitely worth addressing with either the speed car chief tucker or maybe speed bumps are really a good idea since it is also part of the high school traffic area as the speed bumps were placed on wally street that might also be an appropriate place to play place speed bumps as well thank you okay thank you thank you council woman kinzer um I don't know if either Chief Tucker or Mark Freiberger wanted to make a comment. I agree with um, Brenda's assessment that it would be nice for the this woman or gentleman who wrote the letter to come before the council, but also anybody else within the neighborhood. Any thoughts? Oh, I can offer just a little bit there, Mayor. Um, you know, one of the things that we got going on now is we don't have any bodies out. But like I said before, we're going to have four new officers hitting the streets. And one of the things that we wanna make sure they're doing is hitting those probably 50 to 60 different spots in town. Um, right. Some of that spot checking traffic enforcement will discourage some of it, but it, it's always gonna be the biggest complaint. It's always gonna be one of the toughest things to, to crack down on. Um, we joked about this for years in city council about um, fixing Talcott Street and you'd hear some people say, we don't wanna fix Talcott Street because it's essentially got its own built-in speed bumps um, and keeps the traffic slow. Um, so honestly, um, Mark can speak more to speed bumps. The speed bump on Wally Street to me makes, it's the only one that would make sense. Other through streets, not so much, but that's more of a engineering thing than, than um, is in my, my wheelhouse. Um, but enforcement, people out and about, um, you know, doing traffic enforcement, and we are growing and we're, we're suffering growing pains from it. We have traffic problems virtually everywhere, and it could very well be one or two people that are causing the problem. Um, and that's, that's a really almost impossible to enforce unless you get lucky. And I can't have an officer set for hours in one spot looking for one car that might come through. Um, there's easy spots you can do traffic all day long, um, but there's target areas that we can do as well. Um, when school's in session, we hit the area around the schools. 
for the 45 minutes before school and the 30, 45 minutes after school. And those are pretty easy to nail down. Um, and then the going to work and coming home from work stuff is pretty easy to nail down too. Some of that is just hard to do with the manpower we got right now, but we are moving toward it and putting the speed car down there to gather data is always an option. Um, we've got a lot of options um, and getting these, getting this information is always good to add to it. Um, that, that's about all I can add to that. Yeah, I know it, it just kind of adding to that. I send you, I don't know, probably once a week letters that I receive from people who are wanting areas checked because of speeding. So I know that it is a huge issue within our community and I'm guessing probably we're not unique, but all right, thank you. And just from an um, engineering- Go ahead. Or just from an engineering perspective, um, speed bumps, uh, they have their places, but on, on uh, through streets like this, uh, it's been my opinion over the years that I've been doing this, that they're just not a, a particularly good idea. Uh, yes, they will slow traffic down for the people that are paying attention to what they're doing. Uh, for those that are speeding, because that's what they do, uh, they're gonna hit a speed bump and then you've got the possibility of losing control. Um, so I, I, I'm, I, I am very reluctant to, um, to deploy those on, on normal streets. Uh, Chief Tucker said it better than I can. It's a behavioral thing. It's, it's more or less an enforcement issue. I would mention that on, on that same street, I have a request that David has had on his board for several months uh, to look at uh, the possibility of adding another stop sign or two on that boulevard. Oh. I have the same basic concerns about doing that uh, because you, you generally just set people up for then disobeying a law because they're going to run a stop sign they don't think is necessary. Uh, it's it's human behavior and that's difficult to fix. They, Council Member Allen said it well, there's, there's a more pithy way of saying the same thing, but human behavior being what it is, it's difficult to put enough engineering in to, pr to prevent uh, bad behavior. Um, but that being said, uh, you know, if I'm directed to look at that further, I will certainly do so. Thank you. Um, Councilman DeYoung. Hi, thank you, Ma Mayor. Um, I am hearing kind of a systemic issue about education. And as we talked about earlier about uh, education being one of the three E's uh, along with enforcement and uh, engineering, uh, I would, it's not a solution uh, to end this, but as a progressive step to maybe put something in the city scene, an article, um, uh, maybe uh, put out some signs, child, children at play, that type of thing, and, and start a process of education. Um, and I, I would proffer that for this discussion. Thank you. All right, thank you. And Councilwoman Kinzer, I thought I saw your hand up as well. There we go. Yes, I would just like to say I have, you know, I've been public, I've been a witness to the traffic problem on, in that intersection. And um, I just like to definitely ask Chief Tecca that it can be a priority to put the speed car, the speed sign in that area to just bring awareness to people. I think it would just remind them that, um, hey, slow down guys. This is the true speed limit here, not what you want it to be, right? And we, we can certainly do that. Um, and one thing, Mayor, just, and somebody mentioned earlier, kind of anecdotal, um, when we put, I put out something just the other day whenever I was out doing some traffic and one of the, and about half of the comments where people were complaining about other cars going too slow. It was about a 50 draw um, as whether traffic is going too slow. And I heard a comedian say this once and, I, and then I'll shut up. People that are driving faster, you are maniacs and people driving slower than you are idiots. Um, and there is, there, that is a part of a component, but there are just a lot of people. I sat at Jamison and Township there, Carl, um, one afternoon. Not a lot of just blowing the stop sign, but a lot of stop and go, you know, the California stops rolling through the stop sign. Um, that's, that's everywhere. And it, we're, we're going to address that when I get my, my little baby police officers crawling around bugging everybody. Then you're going to hopefully be getting some other complaints. 
why are the cops stopping so many cars? <laughs> and that's what's going to be happening. Great. Great, Chief Tucker. Thank you. All right, so um, there are no more comments. I'm gonna move on here so we can get on to our business. I have only a couple things. First off, um, you heard Doug mention that we have been meeting with our legislatures and we do have one more. Um, the requests of course for funding have been submitted and um, our meetings are nearly complete, but we have reached out um, across our um, district. We have a meeting set up with uh, Liz Lovelet. And uh, the reason for that is because she was very supportive when Mark and I went down to testify um, last year regarding the undercrossing, the BNSF un undercrossing. She really um, instigated a great conversation that we believe led to the, um, the decision to provide them funding for us. So we're gonna be speaking with her um, later on, ne well, next week. So. Um, also, I have been um, in conversation with Senator Wagner. He's been really great about letting me know about bills that he uh, would like some support on. We do receive a hot sheet and the hot sheet talks about the different bills. Um, let me know, um, council members, if you're interested in receiving that, I can shoot it out to you so that you can look up some of the bills that are being considered in the legislature. Um, just another comment about uh, a reminder about council retreat. Council retreat will be in April and I'll be um, setting up those dates for you to consider um, here within the next uh, week or so. Uh, be thinking about uh, the subjects that you would like to talk. If there's anything in particular, please let me know so I can add it to the agenda that I am putting together. And um, just kind of a, a kind of a PR here, um, letting everyone know that the Skagit Public Health uh, COVID-19 test site will no longer be operating on Saturdays. Um, the change comes as the public health prepares to permanently close the test sites after March 12th, and this is due to a lack of utilization on Saturdays. So there are um, other testing sites available within the community and a full listing of those sites are listed at the Skagit County um, Health Department. So um, other than that, we are moving on. Public comment. It is 6.51, I will open it up for public comment. Um, please, if there's anybody online who would like to speak, please uh, state your name, your address, and try to keep it to three minutes. So is there anyone for public comment? Okay. Hearing none, I just want to remind uh, the public that you can provide written questions or comments via email, or you can send it by letter, and we will read them into the record. It is now 6.52, and I am going to close public comment. Moving on to unfinished business, the first thing on the um, agenda tonight is uh, the emergency moratorium on modifications to the CBD. And Mr. Coleman, you are on. All right, thank you, Mayor. Hello again, Council. So um, since I put out this uh, memo on uh, last week to get to the council, a lot of new information has surfaced and discussions. So uh, what I'm gonna uh, be recommending is actually a little different than what you're seeing um, on the memo itself. So at the last city council meeting, uh, council had requested, had brought up a concern about the new garage doors on a, on a building in the central business district. Um, and uh, the, the, the consensus was that that was not a good thing. Uh, what we identified was the, the design standards maybe didn't uh, cover that issue and um, they did not get an application to do that modification. So, uh, Quickly thinking, you know, we, we threw out the idea of having a moratorium until uh, we could figure out uh, what needed to be done and make any adjustments to make sure that no other such changes happened to the buildings in the historic part of downtown. So since uh, we put out the memo, I've done more research on the, um, the design standards and the requirements for getting, for having a design review done. And what we've found is that our design standards would uh, to a certain extent prevent what uh, was a use like those garage doors. The applicant did not get a, a design review application ahead of time. 
Um, so that's that's a that's a different issue that we can sort out another time. Uh, but as far as the need to put a moratorium in to prevent something like this again, we've determined is not necessary. Uh, we believe that if they had applied for design standards, we do, would have had the ability to say that no, they they couldn't do it that way. That we would need to they would need to do something different and. Uh, because of that, we're now recommending that we do not place a moratorium on building permits and uh, <clears throat> design review applications for the CBD, because the design standards do uh, prevent that necessity. So in lieu of having a design uh, a moratorium, what, you know, what I'm proposing is for, um, as Council Member DeYoung has pointed out, education. Um, to, we think it would be a go a long way if we could educate the downtown business owners of the necessity to uh, submit an application for design review for modifications. Um, and uh, of course, review our standards and make sure that staff is aware of how the process is supposed to work to make sure that when they see something like this, that um, the, the person that's making the modifications knows that they need to get it, a permit before they do work. So a project like this, you know, normally wouldn't require a building permit because it was a minor modification. So the, you know, uh, a person might think, well, I don't, I don't need a permit. I'm just replacing a, a door with a window or a window with a door or whatever, something minor like that might be. But because we do have specific design standards for the central business district, people need to know that even if you want to make any modifications to the exterior of your building, you need to go through a design review process, which is administrative. So uh, that's a, it's a process that is not as lengthy as like going to a design review board or anything like that. Uh, so if you have any questions, um, now's a great time to, to bring them up, uh, but we, we don't see a need for the, the moratorium we do intend to bring the design standards to the planning commission uh, in, in the very near future to have them review it and make sure that uh, they're up to date and make sure that they meet the city's current vision for our downtown. A lot's changed since the uh, planning commission and city council have last reviewed the downtown uh, design review standards. I think the last time it, anything came up was a quick knee jerk change uh, back in like 2007 or eight. So I think it's very appropriate that uh, the planning commission do, does take a, a look at the design review standards and we review our processes. And in the meantime, we'll focus on education, education and education. All righty, I definitely have comments. Go ahead, Councilwoman Kinzer. We have no reassurance following those um, recommendations that property owners within the central business di district are going to abide by the historical standards that we want to keep in place for our central business district. That provides nothing. If we don't put a moratorium on and revise the code to follow historical wishes for our town to follow, we risk a tremendous amount of loss of the historical character of our city. And this just breaks my heart. It really does. Um, we didn't meet what the goal we wanted to meet a year or two ago to get historical designation for our town. We really, really, really have to keep moving forward to make that happen. And if that had happened, we would have had all of that um, code and everything set forth as a result of that, but we didn't get that. 
And so I really feel that the city has got to take every step they can to preserve the character of the city in the CBD. We're going to lose too much if we don't put into place a moratorium right now and revise that code. Period. Thank you. Thank you. Excuse me, Councilman Kinzer. What have you invested in what have you invested into the downtown? Uh, what do you know about the history of the downtown? There used to be like four or five shoe stores. There used to be JC Penney's. There was a, a Safeway, Safeway Apartments, three jewelry stores. I mean, I, I don't know what the downtown is supposed to look like. I was there and it's an ugly situation for business people to try to survive through. And if we want to just come through as government and beat them up, then let's do it. But I don't know what you're proposing. Well, Glenn, you asked what my investment is. I've lived in the Upper River area since I was 19 years old. I don't have the deep business connection that you do, but Sidewally has always been my luck, okay? That's my connection. That's my investment. I was a member of the Sidewally Downtown Association on the board of directors for two years, and we tried to make it happen to get it um, part of the whole entire national designation as a business, dis business district. There wasn't enough interest to keep that downtown association going, and so it failed. But still, there are people in this community that have to keep the historical designation of this city alive, and I'm not willing to let that go. It has got to happen, and that doesn't mean that the entire facade and the entire central business district needs to change. We need to keep the appearance of a historical town with a hundred what we've got 140 years of history behind us now and i have been studying that as a member on the board of the museum we have got a tremendous amount of history that we need to keep alive keep the central business district going as a historical part of our community i don't know what more do we want that's what we have to do Matt, Brenda, Matt, I, I, I appreciate your love for the community. I breathe blue and white uh, for Cedar Woolly Cubs. Uh, you know, I've been around when we were doing the murals and all the, oh gosh, the brown sep sepias and all that stuff. And it's worked great. It's been wonderful. But uh, so many things have evaporated from us and you know i mean gosh it's just you know i i want it to be the same nobody loves cedar woolly i i've lived here for 70 years okay uh and grew up in a family that owned businesses here and i can tell you about literally shoe store and everybody else in town but anyway uh, I know we need to maintain certain standards, and we did have a design and review committee about 25 years ago, and maybe we need to reenact that, okay? And, and I love your love for Cedar Woolley because I share it with you, okay? Great, Glenn. Thank you. Councilwoman Kesty? Oh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I just kind of wanted to weigh in here. Um, my recommendations for the uh, moratorium was not to hinder businesses, but to preserve our historic buildings from permanent changes to them during a temporary situation. And I, I'm listening to everybody and what's going on. And I, I'm, am I hearing you correctly, John, that this would not have happened had they went through the proper channels and that you guys can, in fact, say that this wouldn't happen again based off of what we already have that, that's accurate we think 
our design standards are such that it, we, and, you know, had the application process gone through as it uh, should have, we would have been able to work with a business owner to uh, not have this situation come up. Um, we try to be conscious of the impacts of, you know, design standards on the local businesses. And, uh, but the, I think the message is clear that the council wants the, the highest level of design standard enforced the, from our, our current standards. And so what we wanna do is make sure, we think our current standards can do that, but we wanna make them more specific and improve them to make sure. And uh, that's that's what we're thinking we might be able to do for you. Okay, because I'm good, I'm good with that, uh, knowing that, you know, this was an awful thing that happened and we can try and prevent this in the future. And then also working towards the future to have really strict guidelines for our historic buildings um, without hindering the business. So thank you. Madam Council, Mayor. Yes, oh. Councilman McGoffin. Hi, thank you. Um, I just wanna start by saying, I really appreciate all the feedback on historic preservation. And I too, you know, see the significance and wanna protect that. Uh, but I did talk to the owner of the business that, were, that brought all this about, and he was unable to join the meeting tonight. I asked him, you know, to do a public comment or to have his chance to explain. So I just like to speak on his behalf. You know, his point is he's been paying from his savings account for six months. You know, he's really struggling. Um, and the state you know, regulations and the lockdown have been really difficult for him as well as for many other businesses. And his point was, you know, I'm just trying to, you know, make ends meet right now. And this was just a, a means to help me operate within one of the phases that we're in. And I think that, you know, we have to listen to our businesses too, because what good is a historic town if it's a ghost town? You know, I, I really like the buildings too, but I don't wanna see them empty. And if we scare our businesses away and we prevent them from making changes at a really unique time, you know, I could understand doing something like this if it was not during COVID and we didn't have all these restrictions from the state, but you know, our businesses are already on the ground and are we gonna keep kicking them with, you know, more regulations and preventing them from making necessary changes to stay open during one of these phases. Um, I just think that we should be really careful um, doing a moratorium on changes when it might be the very thing that saves a business from you know, closing permanently. And then we have no tenant in that historic building. Uh, so that's kind of my view. Um, getting confirmation from John that you know, had they have submitted this, it would not have got, gotten approved. I think going back to the education, that's really where our focus should be. Um, and we can, you know, modify our design standards moving forward. Um, but it was a reassurance knowing that this would have been blocked if it had been submitted. So those are my two cents. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Any other comments? Response to Brendan, please. Yes. Councilwoman Kinzer. Brendan, I really want you to know, and I, I hope you can reach out to the bullpen property owner manager that this was never intended to bash them for what they did, okay? It just really opened our eyes to, wow, wow, this could happen all over our city and really damage our historical character. So this was not meant to be a personal attack on them by any means whatsoever. They, they carried this through before, before it even came to mind you know, that, wow, um, this is something we really need to address. So I hope you can extend that, that, that thought process to them, please. And also, you know, if they had waited two more days, they probably wouldn't have even had to make that modification. That's really sad that there can be a little more communication through all the the channels that, hey, if you just hold on a little bit more, we're gonna be there and, and be able to meet your goals. So, okay, thank you. All right, thank you. I saw Councilman DeYoung, you have a comment? Yeah, um, yeah a question for John. 
Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, John, what is uh, the standard uh, in order to have a design review? At, at what point does someone in the uh, central business district uh, uh, meet that in the flow chart of we have to do a design review? Pretty much any modification to uh, the exterior of a building. So even putting paint on the building? like Even putting, putting paint on a building, yeah. Okay. So we're, right, we're, walk, we're already walking a, a kind of a, a, a thin line of having high regulations for people to do little things like paint their buildings or awnings that type of thing and yeah. awnings yes we do yeah we do regulate the awnings and you know we, we try to we try to be as helpful as we can as people are trying to make uh, of changes to their building you know improvements to their building mm -hmm. uh, but obviously you know Hey, we want to keep the, the the design standards in mind, and so the way we can be helpful is to uh, do it administratively. The uh, council member Allen had mentioned that we used to have a design review committee, and so every time somebody wanted to do a sign mm -hmm. on their business or to um, uh, paint their building, for example, they would uh, have to wait until the design review committee met, which is once a month. It was the planning commission back in those days. Um, so that, that was a long process. And we heard a lot of frustration from that at the council level. And so the council changed that. I think it was in 2008 or nine. Um, and so we made that administrative as a, as a way to um, make it easier on the downtown, downtown business owners. Okay. And so, um... I, I want to get to a data point. I'm, I'm hearing here. So when I hear historical, that for me means there's some sort of certificate or some sort of, um, someone has said this is a historical site. Uh, or is this more anecdotal that is being used like in, in, uh, in promotional materials? Um, I, I'm just trying to figure out uh, what, what body has declared it uh, historical. Um, there is no historical designation to the central oh. business district or any part of the town. Um, okay. uh, you, you can ask council member Kinzer to uh, more about the historic designation that she was referring to. Um, that was and the main a, program. With you. And then another historical does you know, concern is, you know, like the, the bullpen building, the, the, the building housing the bullpen is one of the oldest and more historic buildings in, in the town. You know, not all of them are that old or uh, that historic, but uh, some definitely have uh, more historic value to them than, you know, some of the ones built in the 50s and 60s. Thank you very much. Comment, please. Hey, you want to take that? Okay. May I make a comment? Yes, go ahead, Councilwoman Kinzer. Okay, we have the Cedarwood Downtown Association on trying to declare the CBD as a historically designated site for three years. Unfortunately, the Cedarwood Downtown Association failed at that aspect. And I really, really, really hope someone will pick up the ball and carry that and make that happen because that is absolutely necessary to keep the historic character of our downtown's CBD. There is no other way to make that happen at this point. We have got to do this. And someone's gonna have to pick up the ball and make that happen. We can't keep arguing that we have no historic designation. Yes, we do. It is there, bright and clear. We know where our historic buildings are. What is it going to do to make it happen to declare that area historic. I don't know. I kind of toss my hands up in the air at this point. What's it gonna take? People help me out here. I'll help you out, Brenda. We can get that done. Okay, if there are no other comments, I understand then Mr. Coleman, what you are recommending is that we not move forward with the moratorium. Is that correct? Uh, based on, yeah, uh, based on the, the goal of, you know, will this moratorium, is a moratorium necessary to prevent another situation like those garage doors? It is not necessary to 
uh, have the a moratorium in place. So no, we, we recommend that it is not uh, passed. Okay, thank you. So having heard what Mr. Coleman has said, is there a motion to move forward with the moratorium or does council choose to let it go? Madam Mayor, I make a motion to move forward with the moratorium. Thank you. Councilwoman Kinzer, is there a second? Okay, hearing no second, this uh, motion is uh, dead. So, and we will move on to uh, number two on our unfinished business, and that is amendments to the CBD parking regulations. That'll be me again. Well, in light of our past conversation, I think uh, the council should be pleased with this discussion. Um, this is a second read on a proposed ordinance that would uh, make more uh, parking requirements for new development in the central business district. Uh, the council was concerned that uh, our current code allows for new development that has commercial on the, on the bottom within the central business district area to not have any parking requirement associated with that with the residential units. So uh, the Planning Commission reviewed the parking requirements for the Central Business District and made recommendations uh, that the code be amended to put in standards for um, parking for residential units and associated in, in mixed use buildings in the Central Business District. Um, the amounts of parking are based on two tiers, whether that building is uh, over 10 residential units or and over 4,000 square feet of commercial development or whether it's, it falls under those thresholds. The buildings over those thresholds have a parking requirement and the buildings with 10 or fewer residential units um, <clears throat> would have no off-street parking required um, and that was based on um, uh, the, the thought that a small building such as uh, the building that burned down, that's a small lot, it's only, uh, I think, 8,000 square feet. Uh, almost half of that uh, parcel would be taken up with parking if, um, if parking was required for, on, on a lot like that. So the Planning Commission carefully reviewed and found that uh, smaller projects will not have a, an, a significant impact on the parking situation in the downtown, but the larger developments, you know, if the, the, uh, the old Ford dealer were to develop, then the, they could get numerous units on there and that would definitely cause a parking problem. So they came up with a two-tiered system and uh, to require parking on those larger buildings. So this is for new development. It does not really affect um, existing buildings in the downtown. Um, so if there's any questions about it, I'm happy to, to field them now. Any questions for Mr. Coleman? Yes, I have a question. Go ahead, Councilwoman Kinzer. Um, John, one of the biggest pushes over the last couple of years is to get residential over commercial on existing buildings. That has been a really big topic. So why would we not consider requiring parking um, if those situations happen? Because we were really hoping for that over the last couple of years. Yeah. Um, so the, um, this primarily, this was primarily a project to review um, a, for new development. There are a handful of buildings in the central business district that have the potential for residential above. Uh, for example, the, the most obvious one is the gateway building at the corner of uh, Ferry and Wood and uh, Metcalf. I believe there's two, maybe three stories above 
um, you know, the Mestizo, Mestizo is technically not in that part of the building, but it's that building. Um, there's two or three stories above that used to be apartments or a hotel. And uh, there was definitely a potential for those to be converted to residential units. And the, the idea of uh, getting people in those buildings is actually very, uh, it, the, that would be a good thing. We'd get more people downtown um, and we would get a use in the building now that's currently vacant. So it makes the building, uh, you know, you know, if there's people living in there, then there's better building maintenance, the building can be taken care of. It, that's also one that, you know, when people think of iconic buildings in the downtown, that's one of them. So it'd be great to get some life into that building. Now we get to some of the, some of the realities of the situation. This is a, if you've, uh, for those that have been part of the Main Street programs, uh, getting people living in the upstairs of these, <laughs> these older buildings, is a problem everywhere in not just our state and not just our city. These buildings are old and in our area, we live in an earthquake area. So they don't have the uh, earthquake stability. Um, they don't have elevators. They don't have fire sprinklers. So anybody that wanted to uh, put uh, apartments in there have to address all of those issues. So sometimes that means uh, stabilization of the building for earthquake standards. Sometimes it means putting elevators depending on how they design it and how many units. Um, and usually it requires fire sprinklers. So all of those things start to add up and become cost prohibitive for a building owner to revitalize the upstairs building part. So. It is, uh, you know, one, it's one of those things that as the building and planning department, we would like to see people be able to invest in their buildings, but because of the, the costs, it, um, it becomes very difficult for those building owners to do so. So what we try to do is um, give incentives for that. And one incentive is to not also put a parking requirement on top of all of these other requirements that they have to do. So that's one that, you know, if, this, if the city council would like to, to review on the case that uh, if there is a serious concern that, um, you know, the, the above uh, the, the quilt shop, for example, there's some space up there that could be converted to apartments, probably, I don't know, six units maybe, it would that, you know, would it be a be would it be a benefit to have people living in that building, or is or is the concern about parking a bigger concern, and uh, would we need to address that in specific code? Right now, we're trying to incentivize those handful of buildings that uh, are in the downtown that have the potential for residential above in these existing buildings, uh, incentivize them to be able to do so, and even at that, it's a stretch for somebody to make it pencil. That, that was a long answer. Sorry about that. Any other questions I, for? I've got a question. Yeah, John. Uh, Go ahead. Councilman Allen. And uh, above the fabric shop, uh, that used to be the night of this institutional knowledge. Uh, it's a fire trap up there, above. Uh, the old Oliver Hammer Safeway Apartments. My grandmother lived there for 30 years. I, I have some institutional knowledge. And, uh, but okay, the deal is now they have businesses there. Where are the people supposed to park if they don't park on the city streets? That parking lot behind, I think, was funded by local merchants years ago, like 40 years ago. And, you know, I mean, what are we supposed to do? Okay, that, that's all I'm asking you, John. So that's another point is, you know, um, if somebody puts apartments in an existing building, there's, there's no parking on site. Because uh, those those uh, downtown buildings take up their the entire lot on which they sit, so 
you know, asking them to asking the building owner to then find a parking lot to put nearby to to put their residence uh, cars in uh, is, is tricky. Um, you know that means that they would have to buy another lot somewhere, and uh, so what we generally do is you know for those downtown buildings and the and Councilman Allen correct me if I'm wrong we have the city owned or city managed parking spots the one behind Woolly Market and the one next to the Masons that was purchased either by the city or by the downtown chamber association and managed by the city um, so that's where you know business owners are you know they the employees are intended to, to to park and let the shoppers park on the street so that is the system that we have in place right now to accommodate the people that work downtown. There's not a whole lot of residential in those buildings downtown. Uh, and again, the theory uh, would be if, they, if some of those existing buildings were converted to residential above, the, the, those residents would be there during the day, they'd be at work and at night they'd be there, they'd be parking there and hopefully not parking, leaving cars around but it hasn't been a problem so far. We haven't seen anybody convert any of those existing buildings in the downtown in the 15 years that I've been working with the city. And occasionally we get the people that try and we, we do what we can to really help them make that happen, but nobody has been able to make it pencil yet. Well, you kind of hit right on the head where you said, you know, I mean, it, it, they should park, uh, all I know is all the business owners in the old days, if their employees parked on Main Street, they were fired. They parked in the city lot and left the, the parking stalls open for customers on the Main Street. And I think that's what the council has to remember too, okay? So... Um... We are looking at the issue. It is, should the city adopt the planning commission's recommended amendments to the parking regulations for the new development in the central business district? If there are no have more- another, um, comment, Madam Mayor. Go ahead, Councilwoman Kinzer. I remember two, three, four years ago, the vision of the city was to see residential places going above the commercial places in the downtown business district. And we were gonna um, go through with finding places for those folks to park that were in those new residential locations. And it really feels like we're not having that vision anymore. I'd like to get some feedback. Where do we stand on that? Is there feedback for Councilwoman Kinzer? I got a question. Uh, when it, when oh, get go ahead, Councilman Lloyd. Yeah, I got a question. <clears throat> you know, the, the Central Business District and downtown are actually two separate subjects. The Central Business District is much larger than downtown. How are these ordinances going to differentiate between the two, two worlds they live in? So on, on this ordinance, um, we, we have two separate areas. We have an area bound by the tracks to uh, over there by Eastern, and then the tracks again of, uh, to the North over near Northern, and then to the, to the East by Puget Street, and then to the South by the alley between State Street and Warner. So that's an area that we've more or less defined as like the core central business district. And within that area, we have uh, a little bit looser standards than for the rest of the central business district, which has uh, under this new ordinance, uh, proposed ordinance has uh, slightly higher parking requirements than that core central business district. So thank you for pointing, it, pointing that out. Um, this new ordinance does address the, the core downtown versus the rest of the central business district, which you're absolutely correct, is much larger and goes all the way out to 
uh, Highway 9 along State Street and uh, east towards almost down to Handy Mart. Okay, thank you. I, I have something to Brenda that could be added, Councilwoman Kesty. Go ahead. Uh, I, I think that if we are going to be um, talking about having, you know, living spaces above our um, downtown buildings, uh, quote unquote, historic, which I think are um, historic because they're the gyms of our, our city. They're over some 100 years old and they don't need a seal or a stamp in order to have it marked historic. They each have their own store, story to tell. However, um, if we're going to put apartments in them where people want to do that, I do feel like it needs to be looked at. We have to have ample parking for those apartments. Otherwise, I would hate to see that happen. So that's how I feel about the buildings in our historic downtown, uh, that there needs to be proper parking if we're going to at least get that in there as well. Like he's addressed this for the new, new builds there, it'd be nice to have something for the old builds too. Okay, thank you. Are there any more questions or comments? If not, I am wondering, is someone wanting to make a motion? What's your, what's your ordinance number? It's ordinance 1979-21. Madam Mayor, I'll make a motion that we adopt uh, Ordinance 1971-21. All right, thank you. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, so I have a motion by Councilman Owen, seconded by Councilman DeYoung um, to um, recommend to the Planning Commission that, that they uh, work towards the planning regulations for the new development of the Central Business District. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 And opposed, same sign. Okay, hearing none, motion passes. Thank you. Moving on then to the um, Cook Prospect Pedestrian Crossing. Mr. Freiberger, I believe this is you. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so uh, the mayor had approached me um, several months ago to explore possibility of putting a, a pedestrian crossing on Cook Road that would service the um, in construction uh, playground facility located on Janicky Fields. And so I uh, initiated a discussion with the Skagit County Engineering Department or Public Works Department uh, to that end. Uh, being that that section of Cook Road that fronts the uh, Janicky Playfields is actually under county jurisdiction. Uh, we've uh, looked at this. They they agree that that is a, a need in that vicinity, and that they should take the lead on that. And so uh, we have uh, put together this interlocal agreement for your consideration tonight. Uh, that will uh, allow the county to move forward as the lead uh, agency with the design and uh, construction of a new pedestrian crossing in the vicinity of the Prospect Street intersection. The exact location is subject to final design, but that appears to be uh, the best location for doing that, utilizing the existing intersection at that location. Uh, what a uh, pedestrian crossing in this vicinity would do is it would provide a, a means for uh, safer crossing of the uh, Cook Road uh, in this vicinity uh, for residents, uh, especially children that uh, may be seeking to get to the playground from the subdivisions that are to the north. Uh, we have the Prospect subdivision, uh, which is in the county, and then we have uh, the Klinger uh, subdivision and other areas that are all easily within walking distance. And so there's uh, potentially a uh, hundred and more uh, children that would be in that vicinity that could use this crossing. Uh, the volume of traffic on that section of Cook is in the neighborhood of 16,000 vehicles a day, 
now and growing fairly rapidly with uh, the continuing development in the area. So it's a pretty important consideration. Uh, the next available pedestrian crossing, and actually the only one in the vicinity would be at the Cook Murrow roundabout, uh, which is quite a distance to the east. And so uh, this, is, this is a pretty important project. The agreement assumes that the county would, uh, would as I said, act as a lead on the uh, project. Uh, they haven't decided yet whether to design this in-house or to uh, seek a consultant to do that. Uh, we have, uh, I've in the memo addressed the potential costs for that. Uh, the way the agreement is stated is uh, if, if uh, the county does that with their own forces, uh, the cost would be borne by the county. If they do consult it out, then we would split the cost for the design phase 50-50 uh, with the county and uh, the same with the construction phase. We're also assuming uh, that uh, the county uh, working with the city will um, seek grant funding for the actual construction phase. Uh, you have the estimate, I think it's 125,000 for the uh, complete project there. And I've given a breakdown in the fiscal impact part of the uh, memorandum there. Uh, the total cost to the city is under $20,000, uh, assuming uh, that we would fund 50% of a match for the construction phase and we would fund potentially 50% of a consultant uh, agreement or consultant to do the design phase. So this is, this is the purpose for this particular agreement. Uh, we think it's a, a pretty good partnership between the city and the county. Uh, we've identified funds within our existing 2021 budget uh, from our uh, from our existing uh, funds that we've set aside for arterial projects to cover the cost of the design phase for this. Uh, wouldn't anticipate the construction phase would would not happen until 2022. So we'd just look be looking at the design phase in 2021. So that is uh, the proposal for the council tonight to approve this interlocal agreement. Uh, to allow uh, the city and the county to partner to put a pedestrian crossing in place at Cook and Prospect. If you have any questions, I'll be glad to try to answer them. Thank you, Mark. That was really well stated. Are there any questions or comments for Mr. Freiberger? Yeah, I've got a question. Um, what is, Go ahead, what, Catherine Lloyd. What is the... Uh, the big cost in the in the pedestrian. I don't understand how crosswalks so expensive. What what goes into that? Well, this particular one is envisioning uh, actually a signalized crosswalk similar to the Hawk signal that we have uh, between uh, Reed and Puget on Highway 20. Because of the volume of traffic, uh, which is uh, not that much less than what we have on Highway 20, we think that a signal is is a key uh, element to this. Just uh, painting a crosswalk. Uh, we did we did look at and we talked about doing it one similar to what we did on Fruitdale with the pedestrian actuated LEDs. Uh, we don't think that would be visible enough with the three lane configuration of the roadway there and with the volume of the traffic. So this would be a more aggressive uh, hawk type signal. There are some other types out there that they'll look at as well, but that's that's probably the preferred one. So the cost is actually the signal and in the in the and the cost crosswalks no big deal it's the cost of the signal correct yeah if it was just a crosswalk either either the county or the city could do that part of the work without any real issues it's just a matter of traffic control and some thermoplastic for the the markings and the signs thank you quite welcome uh councilman de young hi uh thank you uh needed is a crosswalk there and to be clear there's no great separation uh this is a lot of flash a lot of flashing indicators for for drivers and a sense of uh, uh safety for the uh users uh of the crosswalk uh is that correct mark that is correct it is a okay. pedestrian actuated uh flashing uh, uh signal interception or, or right uh, and then just to add to the to the mix of the numbers, is it uh, correct in my understanding that's on the Cook side of uh, the urban village of the R15 um, uh, plan there? Oh boy, John, John could probably speak to that. John, uh, is that, uh, 
east or west of that planned development. So the 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 crosswalk at uh, the crosswalk at Janicky Fields you're referring to would yes, be sir. would be okay. what that would be west of the uh, R15 zone, um, and the the UVMU Urban Village is uh, south of Janicky Fields, so the 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 hawk signal wouldn't really necessarily be that close to the UVMU. Okay, thank you for that spatial relationship for me. Thank you. Okay. Um, um, Madam this, Mayor? Yes. I'm, hey, I'm I'd just sorry. like to, to thank Mark for putting this together. Um, I really support this idea. Having lived in Klinger previously, I know there's a lot of kids that love to go out and play and this would be a really big attraction. So having this crosswalk would be a big public safety um, and was, I think it's much needed and I really appreciate the effort going into it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman McGoffin. Anyone else? Okay, this is a first read new business. Um, is, we will bring this back unless there is a motion. Somebody would like to make a motion. Okay, Madam hearing Mayor, none. Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> Madam Mayor, I'd like to make a motion to authorize Mayor Johnson to execute the attached uh, in our local cooperative agreement between the city of Cedar Woolley and Skagit County to collaboratively design and construct the Cook Road pedestrian crossing. Madam Mayor, I second. So Gosh, I have everybody. <laughs> yeah, I have a motion by Councilman McGoffin, seconded by Councilwoman Kesty. Any more discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Great. Thank you, everyone. This passes. This is fantastic. And I want to reiterate what Mr. McGoffin said, because I think it is so true. This is all about safety and you can't put a dollar sign on a child's life. That's for sure. So thank you everyone for doing that. Um, so we are coming to the close of the evening. I do have one matter that I want to bring forth for the good of the order. Um, I have received a call today from Mayor Sexton. He was inquiring about our funding from the um, the special house bill that we went ahead and um, gosh, what did we do? We adopted it and uh, back in July, it was House Bill 1406. He is wondering if the council would be interested in taking some of that funds or all of that funds and putting it towards the shelter that they are putting together. I am gonna be sending out information to you. I did request from him that he send out some drawings and some information, he did. And so I'm gonna forward that to you and um, would like you to think about that. Um, we're gonna do the research on our own end to see what we can do as far as if, if, if we have the means to do that, take that money and do that. Um, so I will uh, we'll be bringing that back to you uh, later, but I just wanted to make you aware of that. Councilman DeYoung. Correct? Yeah, just a quick question. Yeah, did, yeah. Uh, where did Burlington uh, settle on their policy with 1408? They chose to do the same as us. So okay, they thank you very much. Welcome. I believe he said that what they're looking to do is 45 different units. It's a it's a, quite a large piece of property off of Pease Road, 45 units. This will be for, it'll, it'll be a housing um, for those uh, 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 who are homeless. And um, yeah, I've got the information here and I will forward that. And please, I encourage you to look at that and give it a lot of thought. Okay, a lot of consideration. Anything else for the good of the order? Madam Mayor, I really would appreciate you forwarding that info. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I will also just, because I put it out there, I will also send out the um, hot sheet to you so you guys can take a look at that if you're interested. All right, everybody, thank you very much. Great interaction and, um, and discussion tonight. I hope you all have a great evening and uh, we are adjourned. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Good night.